Morning. Um, so last week I got a schedule in the mail, or actually the over the internet email, and they said, uh, "Here are the programs that you're supposed to participate in." And they said, during the 10:30 to 11:15 slot, they said, "Bohemian Grove speech." <laughs> and I thought, well, what the hell do they mean? I mean, I've been to the Bohemian Grove titans of industry and commerce and finance who spend a week in the wilderness of Northern California urinating on redwoods. But I said to myself, what the hell do they mean by the Bohemian Grove talk? So I called up, uh, I was traveling, so I found it a little bit difficult to get a hold of one of the Debs, but eventually got a hold of them. And they said, well, we don't know exactly but you gave a to- talk at the Bohemian Grove last summer, and one of our board members heard it, so you need to repeat it. <laughs> and uh, I did give a talk at the Grove, and the talk was primarily about the state of American politics. And then I did Q&A, and during the course of the Q&A, I had a chance to talk. Somebody said, basically, is it going to be this bad all the time? And I guess what they want me to do is to reprise some of what I said that afternoon uh, at the Grove. Because we are in a weird political moment. Uh, we, we, we know about 2016 and we have a fear about 2020 that it's going to be another year in which we should not allow children or grandchildren who live in battleground states to watch television <laughs> at least through November. But we are at a disruptive moment in America's political life. If you go back to the 2016 election, it's, a, it's unusual in many respects. First of all, it is one of five elections in America's history where the winner got fewer votes on the popular count but won the Electoral College. Not the first time, but the fifth time. It was also an election in which we had two candidates who were enormously unpopular. Uh, Hillary Clinton's unfavorables the week of the election, the week before the election, were 54%, and Donald J. Trump's were 56% unfavorable. By comparison, in October of 1964, Barry Goldwater was 27, and in October of 1972, George McGovern was 21% unfavorable. 18% of the electorate said neither person was qualified to be president of the United States, one out of roughly every six, almost five American voters said neither one of these people ought to be president, and yet they participated in the election. Normally that number is like three or four percent. One of the great things about our system has been that even if our guy or gal doesn't win, we tend to have a sense we'll be okay. But in this election we had one out of six who said neither one of these people should be put in the Oval Office, and they voted for him because he was an agent of change. 46% of the electorate voted for him. 37% in the exit polls said, I like him. He's got the experience, the temperament, and the qualifications. He's an agent of change, and I'm voting for him. And 9% said, I don't like him. I don't think he's qualified. He doesn't have the temperament. He doesn't have the qualifications. But I hate her more, and I'm voting for him (laughs) because he's an agent of change. Now we're going into the election with the president, sitting president of the United States never having achieved 50% in the Gallup approval poll. No president in history since we began running the Gallup polls in the 1930s has ever failed to get to 50%. And yet the state of the economy belays those negative feelings. The lowest unemployment rate in decades the lowest unemployment rate for African Americans and Latinos since we began breaking those statistics out by race in 1949, wages rising in 2017 and 2018 and 2019 far faster for people who are working the factory line than they are for their supervisors, the opposite of where it was in 2014 and 15 and 16. And yet, we're in for a real dog race. We're going to talk more about it this afternoon, so I'm not going to spend much time on it now, except to say this is going to be an election in which the outcome is likely to be as close as it was in 2016. Think about this. Donald Trump wins the presidency by winning Wisconsin, Michigan, 
and Pennsylvania by a grand total of 77,000 votes out of 13.6 million cast in those states. You work the math. And the conduct of the candidates in this race, in my opinion, from the time of the Democratic Convention in July and the Republican Convention in August through September and October and into November, the conduct of the candidates on each and every day is going to have a far bigger impact than we might expect because the number of people that are going to decide this election is relatively small, 8 to 10 percent of the electorate, but they're going to be conflicted, in my opinion, right up to the end trying to figure out who they're going to vote for. But we're at a moment, and you know how chaotic and intense the moment is. I've, more than once, I've been moving through an airport someplace, and somebody will come up to me and say, God, isn't it interesting? Isn't it exciting? And I'll say, yeah, I'm sort of worn out. And they'll say, so am I. <laughs> I've turned off the TV. I can't watch it anymore. And that's the way we are, because we are intensely interested in the outcome of this election. And we tend to think, regardless of what side of the aisle we're on, that this is a terrible moment in America's history, and we've never been here before. But my message is, we've been here before. I was reading a remark made on the floor of the United States Senate in which of an officer of the Senate, a leader of the Senate, said they commented on, quote, an ignominious and criminal silence by the president. That was Vice President John Calhoun commenting on his superior, President Andrew Jackson. So we've been here before. And we do ourselves no good by not acknowledging that we've been here before. And that at times it has been worse than we have, we have it today. Everybody in this room, I suspect, can remember the grave dates, the days in late, the late 1960s and early 1970s in which this country looked like it was going to fall apart. Two presidents forced from office. One voluntarily, Lyndon Johnson deciding after the New Hampshire primary in 1968 that he could not get reelected because of the animus against the war, and another president being forced from office in 1974 rather than being impeached, Richard Nixon. And we had campuses aflame, protests, kids dying on college campuses, the National Guard occupying many campuses. We had our cities aflame. Went back and did a little work on it. Remember, this all sort of starts in July of 1965 in Watts. And anybody who drives in that neighborhood 40-some-odd years later knows the scars are still there. In 1967, 159 American cities experienced major riots over the issue of race, many of them involving the National Guard having to be called out, and a number of instances, federal troops, the 101st and the 82nd, being brought in to reestablish control over public order. In 1968, in the weeks following the assassination of Martin Luther King, 110 American cities were put to the torch. And we were a people bitterly divided over the war and divided over the issue of race. The Civil War, you want to talk about a, an ugly period, the years leading into the Civil War, the 1840s and the late 1840s and the 1850s, we were at each other's throats. There's a brilliant new book out by Joanna Freeman called The Field of Blood. You may remember from history about the famous episode involving a South Carolina congressman who takes a cane to, to Chun Sumner of, of Massachusetts, who literally is made a near invalid for several years as a result. Freeman's book, though, says this is not an isolated incident. The members of Congress, particularly the House of Representatives, routinely took to carrying pistols and knives on the floor of the House because tempers were so strong. And what is amazing to her is not that there was um, as much violence as there were, was, but there wasn't, that, that, that there wasn't more violence as the country split apart over the issue of the extension of slavery first to Kansas. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. Friday, well, actually Thursday. Thursday is the 222nd anniversary of the beginning of the first fight on the floor of the House of Representatives. Matthew Lyon of Vermont insults, Democrat of Vermont, insults Roger Griswold, Federalist of Connecticut. 
and ends up by spitting on him, having gotten his chew of tobacco up to the moist moment. (laughs) Griswold is furious and makes a move towards Lyon, but the two men are held held apart by the members, other members of the House of Representatives, and no violence occurs. There is a motion to expel both members, and it fails. Lion gets a nickname that will carry him the rest of his political life, Spittin' Lion. <laughs> Griswold, though, little guy, is not going to let it go. And so on February 11th, 1798, he picks his moment. He has a compatriot, General Dan Morgan, General, the, the famed commander at the Battle of the Cowpens in the Revolutionary War, who was a big man. And he sort of shadows Griswold as he makes his way across the floor because next to the fire, one of the fireplaces is Matthew Lyon, who is warming himself at the fire. Griswold is sort of limping, using a cane to make his way across the floor, but it's a dodge. He's using the cane as a dodge because when he gets close to Lyon, he straightens up, takes the cane and begins to beat the crap out of Lyon. (laughs) Members immediately rush to pull the two men apart, but Morgan, who's a big man, holds him at bay while Griswold continues to beat Lyon, who maneuvers himself close enough to the fireplace that he grabs a fire iron and begins to be return fire. (laughs) Eventually, the entire floor of the House of Representatives falls in on itself, and the two men fight it out. They're eventually pulled apart, order is restored, a motion is made to expel both men for a second time, the motion fails. (laughs) 222 years ago, this week, this process began, and next month we can all celebrate it by having hopefully a day in the House of Representatives without a similar conflagration. (laughs) But it's been around. This was just the precursor to the election of 1800. You think politics is ugly today, Go back and read the record of the 1800 election involving the sainted Thomas Jefferson who takes money and privately installs at the Richmond Whig a notorious slanderer named Caldweller for the express purpose of writing ugly editorials about John Adams which can be circulated in other Democratic papers across the country and reprinted. In one of them, Caldweller refers to uh, Adams by saying, quote, he is a hideous hemorrhagical character which has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. I don't know what that means, but I think he was just insulted pretty damn well. (laughs) A Federalist editor returned fire by writing in his editorial, shall I continue in allegiance to God and a religious president or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God? And this was the tone of this ugly campaign. Terribly ugly, vicious, nasty, personal. And think about it. It's the sainted Thomas Jefferson who is paying privately for this editor at the Richmond Whig to write these ugly editorials. After the election, Caldwelder shows up and says, I want to keep my position as an editor, but I want a sinecure at the State Department. Give me a clerkship at the State Department so I can draw two salaries and have have a nice life. And, and Madison says, you know, this guy's a little out of control. We'd be open to this, but I don't really want him at the State Department. And Jefferson says, fine, Jamie, we won't have him. Caldwelder, in retaliation, retains his position at the Richmond Whig and becomes the first editor to write the article suggesting, not suggesting, not implying, but saying that Thomas Jefferson had, had given birth, had, 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 had uh, a, a son by the slave now Sally Hemings. So he got his uh, retribution. He got his retaliation. But this was what the election was about. Two men taking slugs at each other, and it ends with the sainted Thomas Jefferson winning. What a man he must have been. Author of the Declaration of Independence, governor of Virginia, author of the Religious Liberty provisions of Virginia law, founder of the University of Virginia. Popular, right? Did you know the election of 1800 ended in a tie? When the Electoral College meets in December of 1800, it is a tie 
but not between Jefferson and Adams. Back then, you voted separately for the, for, for the, you voted for the president, and the number two guy got to be the vice president. And the idea was that you had a ticket in 1800, but to, the number two guy was supposed to give away a couple of the votes from his home state or another state, so the leader of the ticket, Jefferson, would get 73 votes, and his running mate, Aaron Burr, was supposed to get something less. In fact, just a few days before the Electoral College meets, Jefferson writes his son-in-law. I love the old practice of writing letters, but I really love the practice of writing letters to son-in-laws. For whatever reason, the founders love to spill out their guts to their son-in-laws. <laughs> and so Jefferson says, oh, don't worry about it. A couple of the Georgians are, are going to throw away their vote. We're all, we're all set. A few days later, he gets a letter from, an, from one of his political advisors that says, don't worry, boss. Some of the South Carolinians are going to throw away their vote. But no one throws away their vote. So we have the president and the vice presidential candidate with an equal number of votes in the Electoral College. John Adams at 65 and his running mate at 63. So now the contest has to be settled by the U.S. House of Representatives where every state, 16 states, every state has one vote in the House of Representatives voted upon by your delegation. Have to have nine states to win. On February 11th, remember the 36 days from hell in 2000? Think about December to February 11th, no one knows who the President of the United States is. And the U.S. House of Representatives comes into session on the 11th of February in the middle of a blinding snowstorm in Washington, D.C. Literally, the town is buried under snow. There's a concern that Maryland is going to be taken by the Federalists for Burr because even while there are four Democrats and four Republicans, uh, four Federalist uh, representatives, one of the Democratic representatives, Joseph Nicholson, is near death, his wife thinks, and is at, at bed, at home. He insists upon being put on a stretcher and carried two miles through a snowstorm in Washington, D.C. to be put in a committee room next to the House of Representatives chamber so that as long as he's drawing a breath, he can deadlock Maryland and keep it from going for Burr. So at noon on the 11th, they vote. Eight states for Jefferson, six states for Burr, two states deadlocked. They vote at noon, and then they, they vote almost on the hour, straight through the night and through the morning, till the next noon, 28 ballots are cast between noon on the 11th and noon on the 12th, and every single one of them comes out the same. They literally have to send for their blankets and their sleeping caps, and they're sleeping on the floor of the House of Representatives in between votes. So finally on the 12th, they say, okay, well, let's slow this thing up, see if we can't find, we'll vote once a day, and see if we can't find a way out of this. Six days later, they find a way out of it. One man intrudes into the process, a man who hates Thomas Jefferson. Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton writes a letter to the single congressman from Delaware, James Baird, a Federalist, and says, at least Jefferson has, quote, firm character, while Burr is extreme and irregular ambition, and, quote, in a choice of evils, let them take the, le the lesser. And on the 37th ballot, Baird throws in Delaware's vote, convinces a colleague from Vermont to allow Spitting Lion to cast the state's ballot, and South Car convinces the South Carolinian Federalist to throw it in, and on the 37th ballot, on the 17th of February, 1801, Thomas Jefferson is elected President of the United States with 10 states to six, and is sworn in as President two weeks later. March 3rd of 1801. Think about the consternation of the country must have felt at that moment to go from November through December to January and to February, to late February, before they figured out who the President of the United States was going to be. How divided was the country back then? And yet somehow or another we made our way through it. You know, I wrote a, a book I strongly recommend it to you. <laughs> Damn good read about a period of time that most of us don't pay much attention to politically, but if you think politics is broken today, go back to the Gilded Age. It's worse. We have five presidential elections in a row in which nobody gets 50% of the vote. 
in two of the five elections, we have a president elected like George W. Bush was in 2000 and Donald Trump was in 2016 with a minority of the popular vote and a majority in the Electoral College. Nobody, though, gets 50%. Nobody. We have two years with a Republican president, House and Senate, two years with a Democratic president, House and Senate, and 20 years of divided government in which nothing gets done because they hate each other's guts. They're still fighting the Civil War. And the language is intemperate and raw on the floor of the House of Representatives. I was reading the Congressional Record, 1884, House of Representatives, Democratic House, Republican Senate, presidential election that fall, and the Democrats back then were free traders and the Republicans were the protectionists. So the Democrats are going to pass a free trade measure through the House, not because it has any chance of passing the Senate and being signed by the President, but they want to signal to the country that if you elect a Democratic President, there will be lower tariffs or taxes on your coffee and your sugar and other goods that are imported into the United States. But the measure fails because 40 Democrats from sheep growing regions decide that they are going to get in trouble with the wool gatherers back home if they vote for this measure because it's going to lower the tariffs on foreign importations of, of wool. So the measure goes down. One Democrat gets up and begins to excoriate the leader of the 40 Democrats who have broken the party's ranks and voted to kill the free trade measure. They're led by the former Speaker of the House, Randall of Pennsylvania, the first Democrat in 18 years to be a Speaker of the House, elected Speaker following the 1874 elections. And the Democrat gets up and excoriates him in deeply personal terms. I mean, it is amazing to read these words as he just goes after him, hammer and tong. He is the, it is Randall and his 40 thieves who have stolen from us this victory. Finally, Randall's had enough, and he stands up and says to the Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Gentleman is violating the decorum of the House. And the Speaker says, the Honorable Gentleman from Georgia is out of order, and start to move on. Only the Georgian has not had enough. He turns to Randall and says, I would not blank you if you were a dog. <laughs> and it's there in the congressional record. Four letters, I'm going to let you figure out what it was. But there it is in the House of Representatives. And this goes on for, for, for decades. In fact, one of the routine things that they did back then was at the beginning of the session, the majority party looked around and said, who in the minority won re-election by a modest margin, and can we phony up an election challenge in order to throw them out and build our margin? And the Republicans did it to the Democrats when they were in control, and the Democrats, by God, they did it to the Republicans when they were in control. William McKinley is tossed out of the U.S. House of Representatives in 1884 because he's won re-election by seven votes in his swing Ohio district. And this was routine. It, it, did you ever remember this being done in our lifetimes? No, but every election, every two years, this was done. And these guys hated each other. And the election, the elections in those times were unbelievably ugly. And they were often familiar to, to us. In 1896, the Democrats nominate somebody for President of the United States who 36 hours before his nomination is not even considered a candidate. Two days before he is nominated by the Democrats, William Jennings Bryan is asked by the publisher of the Denver Post, who do you think is going to be the nominee? And Patterson, the editor, is the editor and publisher is astonished when Brian says, well, it's going to be me. I have the Nebraska delegation, and I've been promised half of the Indian territory on the second ballot. And Patterson literally says, I thought he was mad. Later that day, Brian and his closest campaign advisor and his wife, who's a pretty remarkable Gilded Age figure, a lawyer, college-educated lawyer, Mary Brian. And his advisor, his closest personal advisor, Dr. Charles Rosser, superintendent of the Texas Insane Asylum. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. Seriously. <laughs> They're having dinner in, in downtown Chicago. And outside, men are walking up and down the streets carrying the signs and chanting the slogans of the two front runners. Former governor of of Iowa, Republican turned Democrat, and the leader of the Free Silver Movement, 
Congressman Richard Bland of Missouri. And Brian turns to his wife and his friend, Charles Rosser, and says, those men don't know it, but tomorrow night after I give a spe the speech of my life, they will be chanting my name. And Mary, who loves her husband, but is less aware of his peculiarities, turns to Rosser and says, Mr. Dr. Rosser, do you really think he has a chance, that William has a chance at being the nominee? And before Rosser can answer, Brian says, so that you may both sleep soundly tonight, rest assured I will be the nominee because I am what they call the logic of the situation. At this point, only one person in the world thinks he's going to be the nominee. Nobody even considers him to be a potential candidate, which is why he's given a chance to give a speech at the end of a two-hour-long debate on the free silver question. He's given as a reward for having been a loyal free silver advocate a chance to give a 15-minute speech at the end of a two-hour-long debate. Ten minutes before he stands up to give the speech, which is a total accident, six accidents have occurred that put him in that moment, a seventh accident occurs. One of the gold men is going on at great length, and one of the, one of the other gold men says, I, I, my time's being cut up. We need to extend this debate by 15 minutes to give me extra time. And they said, fine, if, as long as it's 15 minutes more for the silver men, meaning Brian, the final silver speaker, he gets 15 minutes more. So before he, he's got it in his mind a 15-minute speech, and 10 or 15 minutes before he's going to deliver it, he's been told, you now have half an hour. So he stands up and gives this speech, the famous cross of gold speech, and electrifies the audience. You may remember the famous line that he gives at the end of it. He says, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. And when he does that, he's got his hands sort of like this as sort of indicating the blood is flowing down his head. And then he said, he sort of thrusts himself out and said, you shall not cru crucify mankind on a cross of gold. He finishes his speech. The entire audience of 20,000 people, no sound system incidentally, is, is silent. He drops his hands and walks off the stage thinking that he's been a failure because nobody has applauded. And as he drops his hands and walks off the stage, 20,000 people stand and cheer and lose their minds. But it is a familiar speech if you've ever read it. He said, there are two ideas of government. Republicans believe if you just legislate to make the well-to-do prosperous, then their prosperity will leak through on those below. <laughs> Democrats believe if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, their prosperity will find its way up and through every class that rests upon it. But this was an age in which people felt strongly about politics and were just as tribal as they are today. And it's a, it's a moment of populism like we're going through today. In the North, turnout in some states is over 90%. We'll be lucky this year to get to two-thirds. And this is a, an electorate in 1896 that is not as well-educated nor as prosperous, nor even as, you know, sort of a part of the American experience as the electorate today. We have a large number of new immigrants who've come in the 1870s, late 1870s and then with increasing fervor in the 1880s and 1890s. And yet, nine out of every ten in the north turn out to vote. Different matter south of the border, south of the Mason-Dixon line. Three states in the south have majority black populations. Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. A majority of the eligible voters, men over the age of 21, are black. And the best that McKinley can do is 24% of the vote in, in uh, Louisiana because the black vote is being systematically kept from voting by, by violence on a scale that is hard for us to comprehend today. In Mississippi, nearly 60% of the eligible voters are black men, and yet McKinley gets 6% of the vote. But my point is the system was broken back then on a way that is awfully familiar today, where the two parties are at each other's throats and incapable of finding a way to move forward. And yet along comes a guy you've never really heard much about who is a mild-mannered, reform-minded governor of Ohio, former member of the Congress, a Civil War veteran, a hero of unspeakable valor, unbelievable valor. He is, enters the war as a private and exits the war 
enters the war as an 18-year-old private, ends the war as a 22-year-old major, having received three battlefield promotions for valor and is recommended for the Medal of Honor, but refuses to have his application pushed, telling his comrades, quote, I was only doing my duty. He survives two suicide missions, one at the Battle of Antietam and another one at the Battle of Kernstown in 1860, September of 1864, where he is literally ordered on a suicide mission by his commanding officer. The Union troops are in, are in a, their line is commanded by a brigade commander, five regiments under his control. The Confederates break out of the trees in a surprise attack on the Union left and begin to crumple the line early in the morning, and the brigade commander is smart enough to realize he better withdraw in good order before he's cut to pieces, so he orders the five regiments under his control to, ret to retire, and four of them get the order, but one, the 13th West Virginia, out on the far western end of the Union line, the far right of the Union line, is in an orchard, and somehow or another the message doesn't get through to them, and the orchard shelters them from the sound of the battle, so they don't know what's going on, and the commander realizes that unless he gets a, an order to them, they're going to be cut off and shot to pieces, so he looks around and spots the 21-year-old William McKinley, then a lieutenant, excuse me, then a captain, and says, ride to the thir 13th West Virginia. And his tent mate, who later becomes a general named Russell Hastings, said, we, we, we thought he was a suicide mission. And because here's the Union line retreating, and he's got to ride in front of it ever closer to the Confederate, Confederate troops on an open, active battlefield, and, um, you know, shells, cannon shells, rifle fire, Right on the, and he's going to be ever closer to the Confederates. So he rides off, and his comrades watch him ride, and they expect to see him shot and killed, and a shell explodes right near him, and they think he's gone. But Hastings later wrote in his diary, out of the cloud of gray smoke came the small brown horse with the erect horseman. Somehow or another, McKinley makes it through, gets to the 13th West Virginia. The commanding officer of the 13th, startled by his appearance, and the order says, can we at least give them a round? They form up, 281 men march out of the orchard. To the, the, the Confederates don't see them coming. They march out of the orchard, pour one round into them, and then retreat in good order. McKinley rides behind the front lines all the way back to his commander's tent, which had been reestablished well behind the front lines, walks in, and his brigade commander turns around and looks at him, and the face of Rutherford B. Hayes turns white, and he says to him, my God, I never expected to see you in this life again. And along comes this guy who has a message of national unity in the middle of this bitter election over what trickle down or, tri or, or, or bottom up. He says, we're all in this together. He says, we will not prosper as a country unless capital and labor progress together. The working man deserves a fair deal, and the merchant and the financier and the banker deserve a fair deal as well and somehow or another unifies the country and once in office does exactly what he says he's going to do and unites the country and, and begins a 36-year period of Republican dominance of the political system because of the popular response to his policies. We forget now how popular he was. When he was assassinated in September of, two, of 1901, after having been successfully reelected the previous year, He's shot by a terrorist, by an anarchist at an at a, uh, exposition in Buffalo, New York. And it's amazing to see the headlines. You would think it's 9-11. The Cleveland newspaper has, a, has Uncle Sam striding off of the shores of a, of a globe. With, you can see the outline of the American coast. And he's rolling up his sleeves. And it says, uh, the, a terrorist has struck. America will fight back. 500,000 people lined the railroad tracks between Buffalo and Washington, D.C. in order to see their fallen, their fallen president. Children took pennies and put them on the tracks so that they would forever have, ever after have a memento of the passing of the fallen McKinley. When he arrives in, in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, there are 30,000 people who jam the station, so many people that the governor of Pennsylvania cannot force his way through the crowd to pay his respects to Mrs. McKinley. And when the train begins to pull out of the station, they begin singing patriotic songs spontaneously. 
They pull into Baltimore and a reporter writes that the last 100 or 200 yards of the train coming into Baltimore, that the people of Baltimore have thrown uh, bouquets onto the tracks. And so the, by the time the train gets to the station, the, the engine is covered with, with petals, flower petals. They leave Baltimore for the final run into Washington, D.C., and the sun is setting. And the reporter, another reporter writes that an entire way from Baltimore to Washington, the, the entire track is lit by fires of bonfires lit along, uh, lit along the tracks, primarily by poor black families who are standing there uh, in, in the dark uh, with their hats over their hearts as McKinley is brought to the Capitol to lie and rest first in the, in the East Room and then in the Capitol. There are 60,000 people. Washington was a lot smaller than it is today. 60,000 people lined up to view the casket the afternoon that it was available. And Mrs. McKinley is so distraught at the thought of the major, as he was called, uh, being, being uh, dead that she insisted that they leave early and, uh, and, and that the train convey him overnight back to Canton. And as they head across uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania and into Ohio, the reporters write that, uh, that as they pass by mines and factories, that the work crews at midnight and 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning are standing silently along the track as the fallen chief is to convey to Canton, Ohio. When they bury him, 16,000 people follow the casket into the Canton Cemetery. Many of them are Civil War veterans like McKinley. And the school children of Nashville, Tennessee, have raised nickels and dimes and pennies in order to buy a train car load full of pea, sweet pea flowers to send to Canton, Ohio, and they're strewn on the path into the, into the, uh, into the uh, cemetery. And there's the sight of these grizzled Civil War veterans stopping, stooping down to pick up a flower and put it in their lapel. The entire cabinet is sitting there in front of the Wurtz receiving volume where McKinley is going to be laid to rest in, until a very impressive mausoleum has been able to be built. The, the Wurtz receiving vault is in front of a low uh, ridge line, about 50 feet tall, about 500 y yards long. And on every, every square inch of the of the ridge is covered with floral tributes. Some of them are from famous people. The Tsar of Russia sends a floral tribute. The president of Argentina sends a floral tribute. But I have pictures of them, and most of them are from working people. The tin man of East Liverpool, Ohio, salute our fallen chief. The, 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 the miners of Lackawanna County mourn the passing of McKinley. He had returned prosperity to the country and unified the country and working people in particular felt a keen loss. The entire cabinet is sitting there. All of them, close friends of McKinley, either before their government service or through their service, many of them are openly weeping. One member of their group is standing, is standing apart from them. The new young 41-year-old president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, cannot bring himself to sit with his cabinet colleagues because he's afraid that he'll be overcome by emotion as well. And the first thing that he says after the ceremony is that he pledges to continue the cabinet and the policies of William McKinley. My point is, is that we were at an unusual moment in American history and we were unified first by the life of McKinley and then by the death of McKinley in a profound way. And I think this is the, what we see forever in our history. We're deeply divided in the 1790s and along comes Jefferson who is deeply political and deeply distrustful of the Federalists but governs in a way that unifies the country. We saw it in the 1840s and 50s where the country nearly falls apart and a tall lanky lawyer from, Chicago, from Sangamon County, Illinois comes along and is elected President of the United States with 40% of the vote and presides over a horrible conflict and yet does the right thing and unifies the country. We saw it with McKinley. We saw it with, we were, last night where they were talking about Franklin Roosevelt. We have Nothing to fear but fear itself. We saw it in Jimmy Carter. More importantly, we saw it in Ronald Reagan after the experiment of Jimmy Carter didn't work out like we'd hoped it would. Along came the B actor from California. We, for, we forget that the election of 1980 was in doubt until literally election day itself. The polls all showed that Carter, despite all his shortcomings, was likely to win re-election, but there were a large number of people who were undecided who were saying, is the B actor from California up to it? And at the end, they took the chance, and the country's optimism and confidence returned. So yeah, my message in Bohemia is the same as the message today. 
It's a shit show. <laughs> Wherever you are on the political spectrum, you can't be happy with the way things are playing out. And yet, we'll get through it. Because every time we have a moment like this, the good common sense of the American people asserts itself. And, and equally important, along come leaders who sense the necessity of bringing the country together and moving us forward. So thanks for having me. And uh, for those of you who are at Bohemian Grove, no Q&A this time around. <laughs> and for those of you, how many of you are going to the El Dorado Club on Thursday night? Oh, God, I'm going to have to have a different speech. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for having me.